It is indeed a pleasure to be back. I feel like I just stepped down from this podium. Uh, I have never given two speeches in one day, and I'm exhausted. Uh, I will get fired up, I hope, as I get into this. Now, as I said this afternoon, if there's something that is really nuts, it's when an architect is speaking, because that's not what we're really all about. We are made to be making spaces, and they're supposed to be on our board. And that uh, periodically, when we venture out into these, this scary realm of standing up here, pretending that I have something to say that you're all just dying to hear, that I have to really convince myself of that fact, and also to protect my flanks. I, first and foremost, am an architect. I am not a historian. What I'm talking about today is going into the murkiest, scariest waters an architect can ever possibly do, because there are historians out there that know all, you see. And there's just going to be nothing but eyeball rolling, deep sighs, long, low whistles, as I make sweeping generalities of which architects are rather good at doing. All right, now, what I am going to talk about tonight, because I first got my first commission in this realm of historic preservation in 1971, when I was asked to restore the interior of the Renwick Gallery, which was the old Corcoran Gallery, renamed after the architect James Renwick. I knew absolutely nothing about architectural history, I mean, his, historical restoration, and we had to go in and sort of wing it. I consider myself a design architect. I like to consider myself an innovative designer in trying to express what our society and our culture is all about. And yet, you love these buildings. No. It is what we are. As Mies van der Rohe said, architecture is the translation of its epoch into space. In other words, we are what we build, and as all of us in this room know, you can look at a city and tell what they were like. Now, the Victorians, what a fantastically marvelous age. But the thing that we'd rather get confused with is that the queen, the queen came to control and into the throne in 1837 and didn't leave until 1905, I believe. That's one long reign that we blithely lay the title of Victorianism on it. But just imagine how within that period, style periods changed. What architecture was in the United States in the 50s, God help us all, is certainly worse than it is now, I believe. But how different it was in the 30s from what it was to the 50s. And good queen was there all of that time, and even a longer reign than that. Within a period of the fulfillment of the Industrial Revolution, the expansion west into the United States, the empire was all over the world. They were rich and powerful, the British. And in this country, if we will try and concentrate today, as I'm trying to spot around, the chief period I'll be looking at is in 1876, which is the time when I, the building opened of my second restoration commission that I had, that of the Arts and Industry Building, again for the Smithsonian Institution. Now, the thing that in my working with these two buildings, I will try to explain the things that I found and the very shaky theories that I have come about and why they did it that way. It is a great period of such exuberance and talent and inventiveness that we all look pretty shabby in comparison. What I, it scares me is with the general contempt that we treat, have treated that past and our heritage and our pride of these beautiful buildings that we take them as if they are pieces of paper and throw them away. The thing that I want to state loud and clear, as I said this afternoon, and it's a message that we must all carry, that architecture is alive and well, that when we see that sign up on the corner and it says, this building is coming down and new building coming up, we all groan, look the other way, and hold our breath. And the odds are it's an absolute terror, worse, infinitely worse, than that beautiful, victorious, graceful, lovely thing that they just removed. Okay, could I have the first slide, please? Which one am I on? This building was the headquarters of the National Presbyterian Church. It is Richardsonian Romanesque, and there is the first bite as they tore off its limestone finial, and the building was down within four hours after that. 
the good Christian burghers of the church voted to do it for money alone. Okay. I have listed their names in the Guide to the Architecture of Washington, each member on that board, because they did it. And you should see what they put up in its place. But now look at that. Why? Why did they build it that way? This is the Arts and Industry Building in Washington. Looking over its roofscape, the towers of James Renwick's castle that he built for the Smithsonian in 1851. This building was built in 1879 to house the collection of the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. Prior to that time, the Smithsonian didn't have a collection. They had a bunch of press butterflies, you know, and a few little odd birds stuff that were given them, and uh, they didn't have a building. And all of a sudden came the Centennial in Philadelphia, and every na major nation in the world built a pavilion and sent over their hardware and their pride. And several of the states built pavilions and filled it up with corn cobs and whatever they were doing at the time of pride. And it was indeed the greatest exposition in the history of man. It was the biggest and the most participated in, and the architecture was absolutely thrilling because it was all there. Well, at the end of the exhibition, everybody went home, and no one wanted to pay the freight home, and so they gave it to the Smithsonian Institution, and lo and behold, they had a collection. Now, Secretary Baldwin didn't, you know, how do you get it down? And he, on his own, hired two trains and filled it up and parked them because there was a great marshaling yard in what we now call the mall, right at the foot of, of Capitol Hill. And he parked those two trains there until Congress got so embarrassed about paying the freight that they gave him enough money to build this building, which I will come back to later. But let us look at what this building is. It is in the grand exposition style of the period. Look at that. Finial, romance, scale, and it speaks of a pride. Just imagine when these buildings were built, what was going on in this country. In 1876, that was the year of Custer's last stand, Tom Sawyer was published. For the first time, you could put a package onto a train, and it would get to Chicago for around $12 and a half, when just five years before, it cost over 200 bucks to get the same package there, and you didn't have a clue whether it was going to make it or not. There was an abundance of free labor and an absolute incredible amount of work all over the country. We were proud. Everybody was on the upswing. We were pushing west. Technology was making a better life. The middle class was rising and growing, and poverty was virtually disappearing because everybody believed you could make it over here. And it wasn't just this way in the United States. It was this way all over Europe because most of the cities, most of the capital cities of the world were built in this time. Now, these past three shots, we have been narrowing in on this finial. Can you imagine the care, the love that went to that? Can you imagine any of us coming along and caring that much for something that's about 80 feet up in the air that would never be that detailed? In the celebration that the Victorian was so good for, what is essential, and it's essential to good architecture today, is this thing of loving care. And that, you can see it everywhere. But the thing that we must remember in all of these buildings, they had cinder block then. And it was a, you were a bad man if you built in cinder block. You know? If you were a responsible citizen, you built a building of quality. And anybody that did that was drummed right out of the club forever. Society banned him. He had no respect for, our, for the society, the culture, and the place that the nation was going. Now, a thing that I've discovered that the Victorian, eminently practical, fantastic breakthrough in structural engineering and the engineering of buildings, that they were functionless beyond belief, that they solved their problems first. Their organization of a building, its planning, and its structure, and the volumes and spaces that they could get within was fantastic. And once they got it up, they looked a little embarrassed. And then they worked like mad to make it look like something it was not. These, dear readers, are not tools. But as you see, they're electric telegraph instruments for the Great Exposition. The, you know, the instruments 
and all of its measuring devices were all ticking away in there and it was a highly efficient little device and the, the miracle of electricity. But then they gave us this nice little Greek and Gothic taste, see? And this evidence of taste comes in again. This is the choo-choo train tunnel. You just can't have a hole going through the mountain. Now, of course, the engineer or the owner of the railroad were the only people that ever saw it. But it existed all over Europe, and a lot of them are still there. These, dear readers, are not romantic towers. They are chimneys to tastefully grace industry and factories. And there are quite a few of them existing in England still. They're terribly black now. This is a drill press. This is a little bit of a huge flywheel that is dedicated and painted and stenciled to make it look like something that's extremely tasteful. And the worker is a happier worker if he's toiling with a tasteful machine. <laughs> now, of course it'd be better if it were black. You wouldn't have to wipe all the oil off all the time. To run this thing, that man has to be there all the time, squirting it and squirting it and wiping the oil off that beautiful flywheel. And it's, his life is better. You know it's better. How, just how much more humane that is than our fierce and anti-human production line. Now, in this spirit of, of Victorian and taste, taste have always been something that has been rampant through the great styles, but not until the 19th century did it really begin to move. And taste makers and manipulators in taste and taste leaders. And the word tasteful became perhaps one of the key words of all design principles. This, of course, is Gunston Hall, built in 1723, I believe, by George Mason. And it was, of course, a colonial style. It was naturally based on English architecture. And the coins are reflecting the Portland Stone of London and the translation of that entire saturation of a style, which we call English Georgian, that lasted for 250 years. And there were such rules that everybody knew exactly what to do. If you left the plinth off of it, the house was known as the house without the plinth. Can you imagine that? They didn't need many architects. Every carpenter and joiner and journeyman could put one of these things together with great grace and style. And it was beginning to work. All of a sudden came the 19th century, and we started off with a whole chain of events. First came Greek revival, where it said that only people of good taste and of high principles and morals would live in a temple that the ancient Greeks produced, because this was the spirit and the foundations of Western culture, and therefore tasteful people lived in Greek temples, and the Greek revival was born. And it took many forms. This is now a church, but it was designed originally as a house, and it was spread out, repeating the Greek rhythms as it turned its corner, sometimes octagonal, sometimes in crosses. Here we are in brownstone and masonry, but noble, elegant and all the time right out of that very tasteful thing and it said that those who lived in those potty little colonial houses were really not very tasteful and not exactly representative of our culture and society now here we are back at gunston hall and <clears throat> what is coming on us now is the great tide of the gothic revival which replaced which followed the greeks and there was an editor for harper's illustrated weekly wrote a piece when he was taking the train from Boston to New York, and he said, looking out of the window, that it will not be long before all this dreadful little colonial building and Greek will be replaced by tasteful Gothic cottages. Gunston Hall was zapped in 1835, and they painted it all brown, put a Gothic tower on it, and tried like mad to make it look like South England in the 12th century. Here we are, there's a simple little house up in Maine, and they hung this stuff all over it, zickety spit, and it's a little Greek revival house hiding behind it. <laughs> Notice the stable didn't even get away with it, you know? That's in Kinneybunkport, Maine. Now these, there's a whole series of these houses, as you know, exist all over the United States. They came out of the pattern book of A.J. Downing, and Everybody could get the book, 
see where you were tasteful and how you lived. Now, the philosophy with, with the Gothic revival was <coughs> that only people of good taste and goodwill and really leaders of our society and responsible citizens lived in Christian architecture, not in pagan temples. And it was all over for the Greeks. Boy, and on came this marvelous stuff. Filigree, gingerbread, cut out, and what a marvelous human scale. It's how they reach for the light, the size of the window. The plan, the plan of these houses are truly beautiful and work and work today for us as well as it did for them. The thing that again is within this Victorian spirit and approach to design, they solve their problem for the family, the growing family of, and, and of all of, of indoor cooking in the same building, even indoor plumbing occasionally is moving in on us now, and it works. And the house, by the time they solved all of this, they said, good heavens, we've got to make it tasteful. And on came the stuff, see? All within the period of the style. Little, tiny, sweet cottages. Now, there was the mystique at this time of the romance of the country, of beautiful nature, and its warmth and, and identity of man's origin by placing Christian architecture in its midst with the corruption of the city because the city at this time was growing with hordes of immigrants coming in, living in very substandard conditions as they passed through the great cities and on up to the plain. But they're sweet. I mean, who can deny that? Now, the Gothic movement went on. This, of course, is in uh, uh, Mississippi, and it's called Nuts Fall Folly. Mr. Nutt built the house. Uh, and it is, it grows, you know, it's a marvelous onion top dome like the uh, 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 Prince Regent's Pavilion in Brighton. It is perhaps a bit Gothic, uh, Italian Gothic with its arches and its brackets. And it is indeed still there outside of Natchez. And uh, I certainly urge all of you to see it. I wish I had slides of the interior because it's really graphic. But you can see the, the sense of scale, the nobility, the massive, you know, uh, and the relationship to you and me. We can project exactly how we are would fit on that with the scale and grace, and yet within the planning, an octagonal house is kind of a neat swinging trick to do, and it worked because it was of a sufficient size and this exuberance. If there's anything I found, the, the Victorians, once they solved these functional problems and these engineering problems with that expression, they followed a marvelous statement that I believe is quite true, that nothing succeeds like excess. They let it hang out everywhere in this celebration of life and of what they could understand. Ah, here comes the Italian revival. Now, in the Italian villas, which quickly replaced the Gothic, that said that people, only good people of good taste and respect of their community, lived in Italian villas. Because, as any fool knows, that was where Western civilization and man reached its pinnacle of intelligence and contribution because of the Italian Renaissance. And of course, these buildings are all supposed to be Italian villas, and they came out in marvelous books by A.J. Downing, and hooray, we've got Italian villas sprinkling across, and Gothic was out to lunch. This one, you can see, gets rather Italian hanging out on the outside and placing over the Gothic revival in the rear. Here we are. This style, I think, you see much more of in this country than any of the other styles. It was one that one could be immediately identified with our very simple, flat, wooden, lineal structures and, and the way that American architecture traditionally reached for the light and understood the incredible light that we had in this country compared to our European heritage. And the Italian, with the dentals and its brackets, was something that a carpenter could really get his teeth into. Bigger yet, that's of course in Fifth Avenue. This is the great city hall in Philadelphia. What a massive, marvelous building. And it's, uh, this is beginning to come in with this time, as you will find, with, again with this great thrust and the Italian, but we're beginning to get a heavy influence of the French of the French Second Empire and what was going on in Paris prior to the great neoclassic revival. This is called the French Nassard style, and it ran concurrently with the Italian style and finally began to outdistance it. It is, of course, the one that Charles Adams is always laying his hands on, and it's where, I believe, that ghastly term of the Victorian monster or Victorian horror came from. 
I see nothing horrible about that house. And wouldn't you love to have Christmas in there at any time? It was designed for Christmas, wasn't it? And again, this house is in Eureka, Kansas. I mean, Eureka, California. The man was a, 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 a tremendous dealer in Redwood and had mills in Redwood. And one time, his, uh, there was a slump in the market, and he turned all of his workmen loose to build this marvelous house. It is in polychrome, and it is said to consist of every known type of Redwood in the world that he brought in on his ship that he also owned. This is just ghastly slide. It is polychrome with a palette that is incredible. And again, here they all are painting it up. Taking many different varieties and forms. And again, these are from all over the country. And how lonesome they all look. That one looks very much like a hopper. San Francisco. And Washington. This, of course, is the, was the War Navy Building. And it was built in 1885 by Mr. Mullet. Mr. Mullet was never paid as an architect, so what else is new? And what he did, he supported himself for seven years while he was trying to sue Congress to get his fee. And he supported himself by writing guidebooks of the federal city, mainly about who worked in which office. The State Department was then in a thing called Seven Building. And he would say, in room four, you will find Secretary so-and-so. And he is from this town. In room five, you find him. And he was a very handy guy. And finally, by the time he it took seven years, he got his fee. It was about $7,800, right? And he shot himself. Now, right across the street from that building, and indeed it was erected before that building, is James Renwick's uh, Corcoran Gallery of Art. And as I touched on briefly this afternoon, in 1851, William Wilson Corcoran, a banker in Washington, who started out in the dry goods business in Georgetown, took had begun since that time, became rather rich uh, uh, with his banking. He financed the Mexican War, became incredibly rich, and got terribly tired of everyone coming to his house in, in Washington and saying, oh, good heavens, this is a terribly boring country you live in. It will never have any culture, nothing but a bunch of people wallowing around in mud, red Indians, and very bad, dangerous place. No culture at all. Well, being very proud and not taking this on the chin too often, he built himself a picture gallery. He began collecting paintings, mostly genre paintings, you know, sweet little girls helping old men rule boats, things like that. <laughs> uh, a, a few marvelous lascivious nudes that were on view for only men. Uh, there was some, a marvelous collection of, of bronzes, uh, of classic uh, casts that had male and female viewing time, which is kind of unique. And, he built, and uh, pretty soon his house just filled up. Now, at this time in 1851, Pennsylvania Avenue was not paved. The White House was there. It was an empty farm across the street where the War Navy building was. And he grabbed, and things were happening in Paris. So he jumped over to Paris, and he took the young architect, James Renwick, with him. And he stood in front of La Fouelle's uh, pavilion, Central Pavilion in the Louvre, and said, do you think you can get that on the corner of 7th <coughs> and Pennsylvania Avenue? And in one way or the other, that gigantic building sits there in this very little building of grand spaces. Now, as Ada Louise Huxtable said, Mr. Corcoran existed at an age before the invention of modesty. His initials appear 17 times on the facade. It says, in quiet good taste over the door, in block letters, dedicated to art, and there is his head in a bust form up over the door. Now, this building got up. Its shell was in, the windows were in, and but they then were going to begin on the thing on the inside. And those naughty men fired on Fort Sumter. Well, Corcoran was a Southern sympathizer. He was deep into cotton, and he was supporting the South very heavily. And when the war began, he got out with his neck and ran off to the south of France. Lo and behold, the South did not win, no. And there's Mr. Corcoran with his picture gallery and his house and his holdings in Washington, empty. During the war, the Quartermaster Corps took over the shell of the, of the Corcoran Gallery. It's called Corcoran Picture Gallery. 
and uh, issued blankets out of there and saddles and things for the army of the Potomac. Well, what are we going to do? Here sits this millionaire, this great patron of the arts in the south of France, an absolute disgrace. And being a smart and clever man, lo and behold, the word comes out that hey, he was not working for the south at all. He was on our side and undermined the cotton market, and that's why he was a great patriot. And he came home a hero and finished the gallery. Fantastic. <laughs> All is forgiven, and it's just terrific, and thank God he did. Now, we had no drawing in this, and as I said, uh, the building was part of the uh, uh, Lafayette Square program that was initiated under President Kennedy and was executed by the California architect John Carl Warnicke. It began with William Walton, President Kennedy's very good friend and chairman of the Fine Arts Commission, pulling the president over to the state dining room window, looking out across Lafayette Square and saying, you know, they have been trying to tear down that building for 50 years. And he said, we really ought to save it. Now, all the president said, and it's one of the rare occasions that the White House takes that sort of initiative, he said, OK, but just don't embarrass me. And out of that came the, res the resurrection of that square and the saving of this building. Now, in history, as Mr. Renwick, I mean, as uh, Mr. Corcoran came back, and he opened the building in 1871, finished and ready. And in this, leading up to this time, we couldn't find any drawings, but I did find Mr. Renwick's specification. Initially, as you can see here, on the ground floor, there were windows, and up above, there was only one window, and that's in the octagon room right over the front door. In the rest of these niches, were full-scale marble statues of the great painters, Michelangelo, Tiziano, Raphael, and who Mr. Corcoran considered where they were, you know, which guys really counted. Now, in Renwick's spec, it says, the window in the octagon room shall be fitted with a tasteful screen, period. Oh, architect, what have we done? You see? Uh, you can just see Renwick sitting there, his legs crossed at the navel, and men coming in great big screens. No, no, that's not tasteful. That's not tasteful. <laughs> they bring in another one that's getting a little more tasteful. What we now do, we specify the wood. We don't know anything about wood. We put it all together in little joints, tell them how to wax it, and it comes out looking like hell. You know? I mean, that's what it was. Craftsmen were there. And we've now become the craftsmen. It's like, when you first get married, and that day after your wedding, if you get up and cook your own breakfast, you'll cook it for the rest of your life. And that's what we did with this. Pity. Well, anyway, Corcoran filled up his beautiful building with paintings and sculptures, and it really was the place to be. In 1871, to celebrate the paving of Pennsylvania Avenue, he opened the building. And it was something to behold indeed. In 1900, he had outgrown the building, and he built a new one down the street in, of course, the French Second Empire neoclassic style. And this building was taken over by the United States Court of Claims, who proceeded to sack it, progressively, as if it was deliberately done with hate. And here it is today. We brought it back with a great deal of effort. Now, when we were into this process, at the when, and mixing things like colors. We would put these colors together, and I, with my staff, we came to sort of rule. If it began to look good to us, we were wrong, <laughs> really wrong. And pretty soon we started playing with deep ultramarine blues, deep burgundy, ochre, brown, forest green, and gold leaf. And it began to take on a squeaky quality that is in the same realm as that. And we began to read. Now, the concept of how do you save one of these buildings? It's no longer the same building at all. It has a whole different function, a whole different meaning. It's air conditioned. The windows, the skylights are no longer there. The windows have been opened in some places and closed in others. And so what you, we really did was try to evoke the spirit of James Renwick and William Wilson Corcoran through color, light, form, and even a brand new vestibule that we had to add. The idea of putting in a drinking fountain is just eyeball rolling. You know, you should have a pail with a ladle in it, and the health department practically had a stroke. But this is 
But it is this approach, because it is not archaeology that you're into, and what you are really into is really the love of what those men did and why they did it that way. The building was falling down, no one had ever put a nickel into it, and through the restoration process of casting and bringing it back, the building is reasonably back in certain key details where it is. This is the grand entrance hall, and that stair, you can hear a roll of drums when you go up there. It delivers something, and you know somebody just short of God is there waiting for you in that beautiful room. And when you get up there, this is looking back down. This is all in oh, seven shades of ochre right now. And if you turn around, there it is. And it's just the most glorious room. It's the size of a tennis court, 40 by 60 feet inside with a 40-foot ceiling. And uh, it delivers. You know where you are. The colors are as close to archaeology as I've ever done, because we found accurate uh, uh, cutting and uh, rendering by the men who were responsible for the interior. Now, the thing that's very unique to see is that all of that woodwork around the side, all of the doors are in a deep brown walnut. But the point is, we had more walnut than we had chickens in those days, you know. And but, but what they did, they put them in pine and sometimes in walnut of what was available. But it was hand grained to look like walnut. You see, that told you that you were really a man of taste and responsibility, and that you supported the art, and that you had an artist come in and paint it to look like wood. Fantastic. Marble. You know, when they, with the great scandal uh, in the Tweed courthouse in New York City, it was a terrible thing. They found absolutely solid marble columns that were painted to look like marble. And everybody said, oh, what green you know, corruption, we paid twice for it, and then they faked it, and it was terrible. Not so. It was where men of quality and taste, they always did it. Anybody could have real marble to dope, but who can get an artist to paint it that way? <laughs> now, up in that frieze, which we hope to restore, between the brackets, it said, of course, Michelangelo, Tiziano, Masaccio, and then all of a sudden, it said, Alston. George Frederick Walt Alston was an American painter that Mr. Corcoran collected, and he thought he was going to make it, and he had him up there in name. But those signs were in gold leaf letters on ultramarine blue with backing of emerald green in a little gold frame that chased itself around. The garlands were heavy in gold leaf, and the entire ceiling was stenciled in marvelous wreaths with, of course, a cartouche of Corcoran dead center in the middle, four times around the room with his initials. Here we are, same time, Richardson Romanesque. This is Richardson's great triumph in Boston, Trinity Church. The interior is done by Lafarge, and I urge you to go into that building. I don't have a slide of it. I've never seen a slide of it, but it is in, it's all of the illustrations of King Arthur that you've ever read as a kid. It is in the with burgundies and greens and gold leaf and fur leaves and stars, and it just never ends. And it's all in scale with itself, and it is in this absolute, delightful celebration of life and one's glory to his maker. These guys, as you know, were incredibly devout, incredibly straight-laced, but they lived to the teeth, as we now know. Behind the curtain, they drank secretly. They moved about in strange little rites, but they went out and they worked. And they had a sense of responsibility that we have long, long, and forgotten. And to the point, we behave towards it as if we are aware of it and are trying to erase it from our consciousness. Terrific. You know you're not in the south of France. Anybody knows that. But my golly, what a triumph of the mood of the time. And Mr. Page's building on the right, greatly maligned, I think is a triumph of our time. And it, the way that it reflects the building, even though it pops its windows and has this ghastly trouble, it still is as worthy and as noble for our time as, as this marvelous thing of H.H. H. Richardson. Richardson's influence went on. This, of course, is his Allegheny Courthouse in, in uh, Pittsburgh. It is part prison and courthouse. And it is perhaps one of the most powerful structures I've ever seen anywhere in my life. Um, it again has been saved, and it is certainly worth a trip. Now, Richardson's architecture spread and influenced all around the United States in tiny little scales like this. 
in a speculative house, and you could buy these things as parts from the local stonemasons in every city. That was number 336 in the capital, you know, and you went all the way through it and you put it together just like a Lego set. And it was then, as they put them out on the, on the street, because they would build maybe 37 of these things in a row, and they'd flip the finials and flip the arches and all go then. And anybody then could identify with the great, rich foundation of the American culture, which is the south of France. But anyway, this is where we led. This is Francis I. You know, there was composite styles, and the true spirit of eclecticism began to move on in shingles and reflecting forms and, and, and problems that were solved centuries ago that we could translate to what really became a true American architecture. The early work of the thin wheat and white, as we know in Newport, Rhode Island, in its shingle style, was reflecting all of this, following this, taking that, and establishing an order and a structural discipline that, that was truly American and was exactly understood by us all. Terrific stuff. Look at, look at the scale of going into that drive and how the detailing is always keeping you in scale of what it's like upstairs. You can't wait to get in those little rooms. And you can feel that half timbering coming in and out and getting up. Just imagine that room on the top, what it's like, as it followed inside the trusses and the overhang and the romance and the sense of surrounding an enclosure and what all those little leaded windows do to sparkle the light. Take many forms, carpenters that, you know, this thing never saw an architect, but by God, he was gonna make a statement on that corner. <laughs> little colonial house being, you know, this is in the Swiss chalet style, did an awful lot. Carpenter work combining, you know, where we took a Greek temple and mitered it on the corner, and the inventiveness, again, through their knowledge of what iron was doing, what the new process of steel was doing, the fantastic invention of the elevator, of what we can now do with, with glass and <coughs> skylights to bring the light on the inside, and how pleasantly inventive, inventive that space is. These buildings, you know, there's practically one in every city, and I think there are three left in all of the United States. Now, this is Frank Furness in Philadelphia. There's the Pennsylvania Academy of Art. It is, to me, perhaps the finest Victorian building built in the United States. Frank Furness was an incredible genius. And if you look at the orders, you can get a bit of Venetian Gothic, a bit of Teutonic ordering up there in the roof. Here we go with truly a massive French Mossad style that was coming over. It is pure, really general Grant spindles with the truncated columns on the inside. And yet, there is a richness in that composition that is incredible. The friezes of the great muses let to within it, and the space within, it goes down half of that block. And as you see, as you come up that approach, how it addresses the street with this richness, nothing cut short. It is carved elegantly and inlaid. And look at the graphics. Look at the graphics, invented especially for the building with such care and sense of scale. And as you follow through, the building is so consistent, consistent in every little turn. And of course, that is what architecture is. It is consistent. It's consistent in its intent and, and its consistency of detail, proportion, and scale. Look at that. Here's God in heaven. All bronze fixtures, the gold leaf and that. When that building, they cleaned it about two years ago, and that wall was a marvelously rich navy blue. Not, it was soot <laughs> there, and they just squirted it with a detergent, and off it came, and everyone was surprised. The columns, in time, many of the columns had been covered up with, with uh, uh, chicken wire, and then plastered, and then boxed in with ply with wood, and had absolutely covered when they were in the process of restoration, they stripped them, and there they were, just as they were in, the, in their original time, and established all of, them, of their colors to come back. It also, I might add, has perhaps one of the best collections of 19th century American painting anywhere. Now, let us look. Who are these two wonderful men? You know, they. when I saw them, I mean, they really indeed are funny. Every, I think, 
vaudeville comedian and movie comedian has dressed like Twiddly Dumb and Twiddly Dee here. There's the two, you know, there's a fox and who is the other character in Pinocchio that sang High Diddly Dee, you know? Well, they are the architect's representative on the arts and industry building when it was under construction. They're the men that are out there, the clerk of the work that look down into the pipe and see the oakum is pounded in tightly and follow the specs. And they do an incredibly important job. Now, why are they, and what are they standing in front of? That is the north entrance of the arts and industry building under construction. Well, in this process, when we got this commission, as I said this afternoon, there were no drawings and no specifications. But we had, I'll bet, close to a thousand photographs that the Smithsonian blew up from various daguerreotypes and everything else into a set of eight and a half by 11 prints. And by looking at it enough and reading the archives, we were able to put the stack of photographs into a chronological order. And in this process, bang, out fell twiddly dumb and twiddly dee, but about a week later, in came this incredible picture. Now, how did twiddly dumb and twiddly dee hold that pose so long? <laughs> and so I just put them aside as I tried to figure out who these men were. Good grief. On the left we have the great architect and engineer, Wyatt, who built, I mean, Montgomery May, who built uh, the pension building in Washington. He was an arrogant, bloody good engineer and not very popular. Standing up there as a great hero is William Tecumseh Sherman, who was put in charge by Secretary Baird, the man with the bowler hat and the beard, to oversee the construction of this building. The man who looks like every banker that a kid has ever thrown a snowball at with a hat, was a member of the trustees of the Smithsonian, and indeed was a banker and a grout par equal all. Then we have Secretary Baird, the second secretary of the Smithsonian, and who is this marvelous man? Look at him with his mustache, his Hamburg, his jaunty air. It's the architect, Adolf Kloss. Fantastic. Of course that's who he is. Way ahead of his time. None of this mutton chop stuff, you see? Right out there. Now, how, how in the world do these little guys get in there? Well, they sat down and they heard of this photograph. It was taken, and they had their picture taken. Everybody signed their names, you see, underneath. And they got together with a photographer and had them piece the pieces together. You see, that double two by four, I couldn't figure out how in the world, you know, how could they stand that way that long? And that's what they did. We haven't changed a bit. We're still doing the same stuff. Now, here is the building in 1900. And you can tell by the ladies' clothes and the entrance gates are indeed the way they were when it opened. The entrance gates changed in 1905. But this building, within this palette, red brick, it has black painted brick, horizontal strips. It has a little bit of Italian. It has a little bit of German capping. The statue up on top, which of course is Columbia, welcoming uh, and uh, protecting her children science on one side and industry on the other. Not bad, okay? And it is not made of lead. It is not made of bronze. It is a plastic that the Smithsonian Laboratory has not been able to determine yet. Not bad. Okay. Now, Mr. Adolf Kloss and his partner Schultz were given this commission the minute that Congress was finally beat up by Secretary Baird to come up with enough money to give at last a place for the National Museum, which indeed it is called, it says that up in that freeze. Now, they had, they made several designs, and they went through Romanesque, and they went through Italianate, and they decided on this style, which is called the exposition style. It is a building, 700, 326 feet square. All four facades are identical. In the middle, there's a cross, which I think I'll come to a plan, but I'm, this may not be next. Yes, it is. Look at that. Okay, all four facades are exactly equal. The gray areas have been totally destroyed by, of all people, the Smithsonian. It is just beyond belief, but initially, the concept of this building, as you entered into this door, you could look in all directions through marvelous arches, 40 feet tall, and that with, with the arches go down the, the transepts, and in each of these four courts, there was a marvelous clear story that went up into a round, circular, rotunda-like dome. 
And then the E's, the, I mean, in the nave, the roofs are like a basilica with a great iron truss up on top, spanning the 60 feet. But in the middle, in the middle is the grand rotunda, 60 feet, and it goes up again another 60 feet. And within the traditions of the Accord de Bodar, of which we're coming out at this time, and Klus was an architectural student there, there is the great process of Le Marche. In other words, when you enter here, there is a certain paving, and it's promising you, but you're not there yet. You open up the door, and in Pyrenees-like spaces, through these arches you see light coming, but you know that the best space is dead center, because the light is more, and he leads you, and you get into that, and boy, lightning strikes, and you've arrived. Now, in this process of doing this building, we had to, uh, I mean, uh, Klaus was given the fantastic pro budget price, and he brought it in for a $3.25 a square foot. It's the cheapest price of any building in the history of the federal government, and for many just causes. In our research and reading, we found that within the first three years, there was a fantastic congressional investigation. They did it then, too. Why was there a congressional investigation about this building? Are you ready? Ten people of the Smithsonian staff died in the building of exposure, just keel off their chair while pressing their butterflies back in that wing because there was only heat in the director's office down here in the other corner. The rest was just raw wood, and that one neat winter, bang. Congress, in their infinite wisdom, 10 stiffs laying around, said, oh, all right, put in a floor. You know? It was the first building, government building, to have electric wiring that arc light, you know, marvelous sparks jumping around that lit it all, and we began to grow with our collection at last, and it was called the National Museum, and boy, what a great day it was for all. This is a, mar is a, is a color chip of the palette that these men use. It's one of about 60. It goes on in depth and range. The DeVoe paint people made these colors then. They have just, through the help of the Philadelphia Athenaeum, have issued a book on Victorian colors, and you can buy every one of them again. In any of these old houses that you're working on, scrape away, pick away, and you'll find that color down there. Their palette, a house of these marvelous things we were looking at, they were never white, never a white Victorian house. They were always no less than four colors. The siding was one color, the barge trim was another, the eave was another, and the sash and the doors were the fourth. Fantastic, but using these incredible colors. And we come along and paint them all white, like we're going to make them Cape Cod. There. All right, look at cloth. My goodness. Glazed brick. There, he paints the black in here. That's painted on. And this is glazed brick, just as fresh as today and tomorrow. For $3.25 a foot, not bad. That's carved limestone tucked in the corner. Now, remember, this building has had nothing done to it except a tax. Now, there is an exhibition there, and I urge you to run to see it. It is called 1876. One third of the amounts in the collection were in the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. And the rest of it, they have pulled out of the collection, and it is all around 1876. And it is like the greatest time frame you'll ever snap into, because you really are back in the exuberance and the celebration of their life spirit, time, and design. This, of course, is the great rotunda that is a wood frame roof up on top. But the rest of the nave, you can see the iron trusses going back in. Now, again, we did this from photographs. This building was painted every color, from olive drab to bright red to with clouds and airplanes hanging up there. And underneath all of that, we knew that those stencils existed. And because of the black and white photographs we had. But what were those colors? Good grief. So we sent a cherry picker up there, and we chipped away, and we got little samples of the stuff, and we sent it off to the Smithsonian lab, and they came back that, well, the red was sort of pale pink, and the yellow, it wasn't gold at all. It was, you know, past, it had all lined out. And so we really didn't know, except that it was yellow. And because of the type of film that they used, in those days, that if it was a dark color, it was really white. And you had to reverse back and forth. And so we then got down with our color chips of that Victorian Arbor de Beau and 
began to sample of what they were and drew these large stencils and had them done. And I feel very happy indeed of how they came out. But what a richness. You know, how, how much have we forgotten of how these men, of how they cared? And just, you know, as I said before, that they had cinder block then, and they never, never would do it. Can you imagine any of it? You know, the idiot laws that have come out about architecture, that, you know, form follows function sometimes. You know, it's not a law. You know, ornament is crime. Oh, help me. Crime indeed. You know, it is the, the celebration of our lives that these things are good, of, of our pride. Now look at that floor. The floor was ripped out in 1958 and taken to the dump. It was made in England by Minton, and it was in practically every church in the United States. The United States Capitol building has over five acres of that stuff, and you can't get it anywhere anymore. Now, it is called a marvelous process called encaustic tile. Can that be sharpened? But what it is, you know, the tiles, oh, they vary in several different sizes and patterns and shapes to get into this funny space. But <clears throat> the encaustic system was always made in England by Mentham, and they would take this little tile and they would stamp with the pattern. And they could take that and they'd put the color in this side and the color on that side, and sometimes as many as four colors, and they could put it into the kiln without spilling any of the colors, and if no trucks going up and down the road bleed, and it's baked in there, and you couldn't see that minuscule little dam of wet red clay in between the two that separated it. And they last forever. Well, we until, you know, the Smithsonian, responsible people. They're, they are our attic. They collect everything. Well, not that, because Victoriana was held in contempt, as we know, for about 60 years. Well, we found a few of the original tiles left in the building before they had built over a, a floor, a temporary floor, over one of the entrances, chiefly the one on the south side. And we then began to work. We set out a pattern that if we couldn't get the encaustic system, we designed a pattern that would come back to using it all in, in solid color tiles, which we might have the chance of having made here in the United States. And we had terrible efforts because the colors were off. They weren't that rich blue. They weren't the rich brown and we didn't know what to do. Incidentally, we put that whole pattern back together from photographs, taken on the oblique angle and trying to figure out that this is a star and that was a pattern, and then with the tiles that we had, we could relate back to it. All of a sudden, like victorious writer coming into the scene, arrived a sales representative from A.H. Wooten of Stoke-on-Trent in my office, and he said, I understand you're looking for some tile. And there he was, and they made the whole bloody package. They're now making it for the, for the Philadelphia, uh, for the Pennsylvania Academy of Art, because they never could find it either, and they're under a large contract to the Capitol building in the United States. And it's there, it's relatively inexpensive, but can you imagine what that glorious room would be without it? That marvelous thing on the balcony up there is an orchestrion. It was built in 1851. It has a snare drum, organ, and it's really, it's like a computer. You put in, you know, a player piano, and it has, well, it has an infinite variety. You can play anything, but you can type that thing out and put it on the roll. And it is a joy to hear. Whenever they crank it up, which is about once an hour, they turn it on. The Smithsonian staff that live in the four corners of this building go right out of their gourd. It's marvelous. The fountain was in the Centennial Exposition as well. But when this building opened, and for indeed most of its life, there was a plaster cast of the statue of Lady Liberty, who stands on the top of the Capitol Dome in Washington. And in 18, 1958, we cut it up with a chainsaw, carted it away. We, nobody knew what was left of the fountain, and so we had to resurrect the shape and its size. And we knew exactly from the photographs, roughly, about what it should be. And so we began, and lo and behold, there it was. It was still underground. And that was the original one built by Clifton and Schultz. And uh, we brought in new water lines and electric lines for the light and the pumps to run the machine. And here we are. This, of course, is Paris. It is my last slide. I'm a modern architect. To quote a friend of mine who is interested in architectural preservation, Donald Lethbridge is perhaps one of the best modern architects we have. He says, 
Every night when he goes to bed, he prays to his maker. He says, dear God, don't make me a creep just because I like this old stuff. You can become a creep faster than anything going because we are architects and we only interpret our society. But to destroy our past is criminal, far criminal. And that certainly is no solution to a 19th century scale. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer some questions and hope to fire you up to carry the banner out. Yes, please. got to watch your year. You see, when the queen died, and when she got older, the last 20 years of her reign, and after her prince and her lover and her consort and the light of her life died, she went into mourning, and everybody in support, the world around, hung curtains, curtains. You know, they didn't stop at the floor. They came out into the floor and three and six pairs, you know. But that, it was just a question of time. When the young queen was a beautiful, really, she was really a terrifically beautiful, active horsewoman trotting around, opening all the bars and bars, balls and callus in London, the windows were open and big. But the thing to remember is that as these styles crossed the Atlantic, they all went through a tremendous change, tremendous change, and primarily because of our climate. This has had a tremendous influence. You know, when you go to England, the windows in Victorian architecture and in Georgian architecture are just twice as high. You know, they're reaching for all of that light, which they never get it. But here we are. Our windows are very tiny compared to that. Thank you very much.